So Joshua chapter 10. I'm reading in the King James Version. You may have to adjust for the these and the thous and the ests. Okay, here we go. Now it came to pass when Adonizedek, king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and her king, so he had done to Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city, as one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all the men thereof were mighty. Wherefore, Adonizanek, king of Jerusalem, sent unto Hohem, king of Hebron, and unto Piram, king of Jarmuth, and unto Japhia, king of Lachish, and unto Debir, king of Eglon, saying, Come up unto me, and help me, that we may smite Gibeon. For it hath made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Therefore the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together, and went up they and all their hosts, and encamped before Gibeon, and made war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp to Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly, and save us, and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly, and went up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord discomfited them before Israel, and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Haran, and smote them to Azekah and unto Makeda. And it came to pass, as they fled from before Israel, and were in the going down to Beth Haran, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. They were much more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. And Joshua returned, and all Israel with him, unto the camp to Gilgal. But these five kings fled and hid themselves in a cave at Makeda. And it was told Joshua, saying, The five kings are found hid in a cave at Makeda. And Joshua said, Roll great stones upon the mouth of the cave, and set men by it for to keep them. And stay ye not, but pursue after your enemies, and smite the hindmost of them. Suffer them not to enter into their cities, for the Lord your God hath delivered them into your hand. And it came to pass, when Joshua and the children of Israel had made an end of slaying them with a very great slaughter, till they were consumed, that the rest which remained of them entered into fenced cities. And all the people returned to the camp to Joshua at Makeda in peace. None moved his tongue against any of the children of Israel. Then said Joshua, Open the mouth of the cave, and bring out those five kings unto, the, unto me out of the cave. And they did so, and brought forth those five kings unto him out of the cave, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And it came to pass, when they brought out those kings unto Joshua, that Joshua called for all the men of Israel, and said unto the captains of the men of war, which went with him, Come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet upon the necks of them. And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage. For thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. And afterward Joshua smote them and slew them and hanged them on five trees. And they were hanging upon the trees until the evening. And it came to pass at the time of the going down of the sun that Joshua commanded. And they took them down off the trees and cast them into the cave wherein they had been hid and laid great stones in the cave's mouth, which remained until this very day. And that day Joshua took Makeda and smote it with the edge of the sword, and the king thereof he utterly destroyed. <clears throat> Them and all the souls that were therein, he let none remain, and he did to the king of Makeda as he did unto the king of Jericho. Then Joshua passed from Makeda and all Israel with him unto Libna, 
and fought against Libna. And the Lord delivered it also and the king thereof into the hand of Israel. And he smote it with the edge of the sword and all the souls that were therein. He let none remain in it, but did unto the king thereof as he did unto the king of Jericho. And Joshua passed from Libna and all Israel with him unto Lachish and encamped against it and fought against it. And the Lord delivered Lachish into the hand of Israel, which took it on the second day and smote it with the edge of the sword and all the souls that were therein, according to, to all that he had done to Libna. Then Horam, king of Gezer, came up to help Lachish, and Joshua smote him and his people until he had left, none, left him none remaining. And from Lachish Joshua passed unto Eglon and all Israel with him, and they encamped against it and fought against it. And they took it on that day and smote it with the edge of the sword, and all the souls that were therein he utterly destroyed that day, according to all that he had done to Lachish. And Joshua went up from Eglon and all Israel with him unto Hebron, and they fought against it. And they took it and smote it with the edge of the sword and the king thereof, and all the cities thereof, and all the souls that were therein. He left none remaining, according to all that he had done to Eglon, but destroyed it utterly, and all the souls that were therein. And Joshua returned, and all Israel with him, to Debir, and fought against it. And he took it, and the king thereof, and all the cities thereof, and they smote them with the edge of the sword, and utterly destroyed all the souls that were therein. He left none remaining. As he had done to Hebron, so he did to Debir, and to the king thereof, as he had done also to Libna, and to her king. So Joshua smote all the country of the hills, and of the south, and of the vale, and of the springs, and all their kings. He left none remaining, but utterly destroyed all that breathed, as the Lord God of Israel commanded. And Joshua smote them from Kadesh Barnea, even unto Gaza, and all the country of Goshen, even unto Gibeon. And all these kings and their land did Joshua take at one time, because the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. And Joshua returned, and all Israel with him, unto the camp to Gilgal. Now, <clears throat> we're going to take this piece by piece, a few things. I mean, obviously, I'm not covering everything in Joshua chapter 10. The first thing I wanted to mention to you, and we will talk a little bit about apologetics. Um, it may have occurred to you that um, God mentions in here in Deuteronomy 7 that we read previously, we may glance at that again tonight, God specifically commands uh, Moses, you know, says to Moses, and Moses says to Joshua, you kill everything everything that breathes. Now, if that presented a question in your mind, we'll talk about that, because that's kind of the one of the outstanding questions with Joshua chapter 10. But let's take a few things in order first. There were a lot of geographic names here, okay? So let's first of all look at those. And this is a map of Israel. You can't see it, some of it real well. The red lines actually represent some of the modern divisions, like that's the West Bank right there, and this is the Dead Sea, that's the Sea of Galilee. You can't see a lot of that stuff. The black lines represent ancient Israel. The red lines represent modern Israel. So modern is imposed on ancient. In any case, the places we're talking about here, Ai, Gibeon, Bethron, and the Valley of Ajalon are right up here in what we now call the West Bank. The Valley of Ajalon sort of goes down to the coast. But that's where those places are. Um, other places that uh, you can see on here, um, it, Jerusalem is right in this area. Okay. So, again, for the clarity of the map, I apologize. <clears throat> this is another, down in the south area here, is where Makeda, Jarmuth, Azika, <clears throat> Lachish, and Libna are down in here. So Joshua's area of fighting, the children of Israel area of fighting, is down in the south. This is, you know, like the Gaza Strip is down there. The Negev is down here. This is where Jesus Christ, for example, went into the wilderness for the temptations. It's in that area of Israel. So this is kind of where he's active, okay? This is what's happening. Just, just remember, too, this chapter starts out with five um, kings attacking Israel, okay? It isn't, Israel isn't, doesn't foment this uh, battle. Five kings attack Israel. They attack Gibeon. Gibeon and Israel in, are in a league, of course, so Israel comes to their aid, okay? So... Israel is not the prime mover here. Um, let's see. Anyway, Jerusalem is right in there. Um, and I think that's probably the best we're going to get from that map, given the clarity that we have. 
<clears throat> just a reminder, I don't want to go over this a lot, but just a reminder as to numbers of men we're talking about that are in battle here. You may remember um, when I was looking at Joshua chapter 1, I think, we looked at <clears throat> a census that was taken in Numbers 26, which is just before Moses died, just before the children of Israel actually crossed into the Promised Land. <clears throat> it, Moses tells, God tells Moses to number the whole congregation of the children of Israel from 20 years old and above. Okay? That number turns out to be 601,730. Okay? That's 600,000 men that are 20 and above that can fight. Not to mention all the other people, but for the purposes of battle, 600,000 men. All right? Now, some things that are in the text that would tip you off that we're talking about big numbers here. And the reason I point this out is, um, I've mentioned a number of times, and I encourage you to remember, the best form of Bible study is read the Bible in a good translation. The second key to good Bible study is remember what you read. And I don't, I'm not challenging anybody's intelligence that way. I don't mean that. But um, when we read the Bible, we need to remember. For example, if we read Numbers 26 and we see that number, then we can relate that to what happens later and have an idea of what kind of a move of God the book of Joshua really is. Because we're talking about more than half a million men just in the Israeli army, let alone all the enemies. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of men here that are moving. And the other thing that we'll look at a little later, too, is um, this is not like you get in a, a Jeep and drive there, you know. Israel is mountainous. It's barren. You've got to have food and water with you, which you may or may not have there. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people. They've got to have that. And they've got to take it all with them. The weapons, sustenance, everything they've got to take with them. So keep that in mind. We'll look at that a little bit later when we look at how Joshua chose to attack the armies at Gibeon. We'll take a look at that. So, keys to, in the text, as to the size of the armies. Gibeon, as we read, was called, uh, you know, a, a great city like one of the royal cities, and that all the men in it were mighty, all right? That's the, um, you may have heard Pastor David use the word gibor or giborim. That's the Hebrew word for a mighty man, like above 20 and can fight. Again, hand-to-hand -hand combat. We're not talking about standing 20 feet away from somebody and shooting them. We're talking about nose to nose. It's you or me. <clears throat> Another thing, Adonizedek, the guy we read about first, the king of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not an Israeli city at that time. It was a Canaanite city, right? But the king there decides he's going to attack Gibeon. So just to attack Gibeon, he gangs up with four other people. So he gets five allies all together, and they're going to attack him. So Gibeon was a major, a major force. Otherwise, he wouldn't have had four other people that would have had, had to help him to do that. And Gibeon itself, as a mighty city, was afraid of Israel enough, they would rather make peace and be slaves than fight. They were willing to carry water for the Israelis rather than fight them. Now, that says something because Gibeon's a big city, everybody in it's mighty, but that's fine, I'll carry water for you, no problem. That's how Gibeon reacted to the Israeli army. Okay, so... Um, and then let's, you know what? I need that light <laughs> because I can't read my Bible if I don't have my light. Let's look at Joshua chapter 10. Yeah, thank you. Let's look at Joshua chapter 10. Uh, I think it's verse 7. Yeah. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of the war of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said to Joshua, Fear them not. For I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. Now, the only reason I point that out is a little detail like that, that just, you know, it's like a phrase in a verse. And, ah, that, yeah, they went up to Gibeon. No problem, right? So you got to think about what, what went on. So the distance from Gilgal to Gibeon, it's not on a map up here, but the distance from Gilgal, which was over where the Israeli camp was to Gibeon, is about 20 miles. You can check this on a good Bible map. You can look at it yourself. It's about 20 miles, right? Now, first of all, let's just point out the fact that he marched all night. It says he marched all night and got there, right? So 
He takes, I don't know how many hundred thousand men, whatever, whatever number it was, it was a large one, and he force marches them all night, 20 miles, to get to Gibeon, right? Number one. Number two, there's an altitude change from Gilgal, which is over near the, the Dead Seas down south, and the Dead Sea, uh, uh, the Jordan River Valley is actually like at sea level or a little bit below. Gilgal is right there at about 800 feet. That's the altitude of Gilgal, right? So then as you go, as you go west, you get to a mountain range that runs kind of in the middle of Israel. Jerusalem is on that mountain range. Jerusalem's altitude is 2562, I think. And then you go down the other side, which is where like Gibeon is and the Valley of Ajalon. That's all on the other side of that mountain range, right? So they start in Gilgal at 800 feet. They go to the top of the mountain range. They go down to Gibeon. So there's not only an altitude change of like, Gibeon's like 1,500 feet, right? But they got to go up to the crest of the mountains first and then down to Gibeon, 20 miles at night, carrying everything they had to have, food, water, and weapons, to attack five armies. So you got to think about what's actually happening here. <clears throat> and then um, the other things I, the other thing I wanted to talk about with respect to um, the book of Joshua, two things really that have to do with what I will call apologia. That's a Greek word, means defense. We'll talk about that first. Um, Two things in the book of Joshua I wanted to look at. One is the sun standing still because many people for some reason have had trouble with the fact that that miracle could occur, number one. Number two, the second thing with respect to um, critics' questions of Joshua chapter 10 is the fact that God specifically tells them to kill everything that breathes. So we're going to talk about those two things. Let's first talk about the, the Greek word apologia, which is the word defense. We're going to look up a couple of scriptures here. Again, I don't have them up here. You're going to have to actually look them up in your Bible of choice, digital or otherwise. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Um, whoever gets there, if you want to read, you are welcome to do that. Just let us know when you get there. It's way back in the back of your Bibles, 1st, 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, Revelation, so it's way back there. If you have an indexed Bible, no fair. <laughs> if you have an indexed Bible, no fair. Okay, whoever's got it, go ahead. Very good. Um, in the, I don't know how that translation translated. The word apologia in uh, this verse in the King James runs, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man. Um, Pastor David, I think still every week, I, I believe, is on a, 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 an internet-based show where people will call in with Bible questions, a radio show called to every man an answer. That is derived from this verse. We are supposed to be ready to give every man, a, to give an apologia. It doesn't mean, we get the English word apology from this Greek word, but we're not apologizing, we're defending, okay? We're witnessing to the truth. Um, so, the next verse I want to look at relative to this apologia is in Philippians chapter one. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, chapter 1. And um, we'll read verse 17, or um, let's see. Yeah, this is a, brief, this is a short verse. Um, let's see. We're going to start in verse 14 and... Read through 18. Would anyone like to read those verses? 14 to 18? Going once, going twice. Okay, go.
Okay, thank you. So the word um, apologia is translated in 17 the word, by the word defense. The other of love knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. The reason I wanted to read more than just verse 17 was look at Paul's heart. First of all, when he wrote this epistle, he was in prison in Rome. He mentions that by his, when he says his bonds, right? He's in prison when he writes it, number one. Number two, he points out the fact that many people are preaching Christ, but they're preaching it from various motivations. Some, because they want to get back at him. They want to add further affliction to what's happening to him. Others, of love, sincerely preaching Christ. What's Paul's concern? I don't care why. I don't care if it adds affliction to my bonds. I don't care. Christ is preached. That's the important thing, right? So the point is, we're supposed to be ready to give an answer. We're supposed to be ready to give a defense. Again, we're going to tie this back into Joshua chapter 10 and those two instances that we talked about. And then look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Uh, this is at chapter 4, verse 16. Would, if anyone would like to read, go ahead. Go ahead, Greg. As my first defense, no one took blood to me, but all parts took me. May it not be charged against them. Thank you. So, um, Thumbnail sketch of 2 Timothy. It's the last epistle Paul wrote. It was his last communication. He's martyred just after this. So uh, he says that his first defense, nobody stood with him. And then he says, may God forgive them. <laughs> and uh, that is just amazing to me, Paul's heart at that time in his life. So apologia is defense. Uh, it's not apology. It's defense. Now, we're going to do something here that I don't usually like to do. And that is, we're actually just going to read something together. I got the information I have regarding what I'm going to talk to you about tonight from two websites, which if you want to know more about, I can tell you. One's um, Apologetics Press, and the other one is Stands to Reason. So they deal with uh, some of the questions that an atheist or an agnostic, which if you don't know the difference, an atheist is somebody who doesn't believe there is a God. Okay? An agnostic is somebody who doesn't know. Now, the reason I point that difference out is when somebody asks you a question, they can be an either, you know, perhaps not biblically literate Christian or agnostic, that is to say they don't know, and be asking you sincerely for an answer that they truly, they want to understand. Or they can be atheist, and they're asking you just to aggravate you. They have no intention of believing no matter what you say. And I encourage you to, under, to, to recognize the difference. Because um, not that atheists don't need to have Christ preach to them, but your answer will be different. And how much time you spend giving them an answer may be different as well, depending on their heart and their motivation. Okay, so we're just going to read this from here, and I hope you can read it. We're literally going to just read this. Again, I typically don't do this, but these, I think this better presents what's going on than, than I could myself. Um, why don't, before we do that, why don't we everybody stand up and greet somebody and shake hands and walk around a little bit and, before we start reading. Cir circulate the blood a little bit. Oh, you know what? <laughs> sort of. There's a, I, if you've ever seen, um, uh, there's an Old Testament commentary by Kyle and DeLeach. Me, Ky Kyle. Yeah, I don't know if he's any relation, that's a thing. <laughs> yeah, I saw, I, saw that, I saw that. I saw that. Only problem was, I was just out of high school at that time. <laughs> there you go.
What's that now? Well, I'll read it. No, no, I'm, I'm going to read. No, no, I'm going to read it. But I want you to be able to follow so you understand. This is a quote from their website. This, these next couple of things have to do with the the um, event of the sun standing still in Joshua chapter 10. Again, critics, uh, atheists, will just say this couldn't possibly happen. Okay, so let's just take a look at that. All right. So again, we're just going to read. Critics insist that such an event is impossible and thereby impugn the veracity of the scriptures. Various solutions to this alleged problem have been proposed. This article will consider four of them. First, some suggest that the text should be understood in a figurative sense and that the event did not involve a miracle. Hence, it is suggested that the Lord helped Israel win the battle in such an incredibly short time that she felt as though the day had been lengthened when in fact it was not. Now, my name is there, but I did not say that, okay? I just want you to know that. <laughs> Second, some scholars take the language figuratively and attach a purely naturalistic explanation to the event. Donald Patton and his colleagues believe that the planet Mars passed by Earth in an unusually close orbit that caused the Earth to tilt in its axis Viewed from the right geographical location, the sun actually would hang in the sky longer than normal. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to point these out is, do you see what lengths man will go to to try to explain a miracle? Why, and we'll go on to see this, but why do we need to explain a miracle? God created the heavens and the earth. God spoke everything we know of into being in six days. He can do whatever he wants to whenever he wants to, in whatever way he wants to. And we don't necessarily need to understand that. Third, others suggest that a local miracle took place. Hence, the sun's rays may have been refracted miraculously so that they gave every appearance of daylight illumination in Palestine when in reality the sun had slipped below the horizon. Fourth, still others take the language literally, yes, and accept that the sun was indeed halted miraculously. Henry Morris explains that even more may have been involved. Since the account says that the moon also stood still in Joshua 10:13, it may be that the entire solar system stopped in its tracks for a day with all relative positions and motions simply suspended. By the way, if um, Henry Morris's Bible study works are great because of that, he truly believed the Bible was true. He took that, it's, it's a miracle. That's all you need to know. He can do whatever he wants to, whenever he wants to, in whatever way he wants to, period. You don't like it? Fine. Doesn't matter. So we talked about this. Um, so before you give an answer, you know, the, does the question arise from a believing or agnostic heart, an unbelieving or agnostic heart looking for further understanding? Or does it, is it a skeptical, atheistic heart which does not want to believe? And you have to understand the difference. You have to be able to recognize that. Again, not that atheists don't need to have Christ preach to them or a defense for what we believe is the truth of God's word. However, again, it may change the nature of your answer. It may change the time you expend in giving that answer, depending on the individual. Um, the next thing we were going to look at, we looked at the sun standing still. The next thing is the whole idea of God telling Israel, Joshua, kill everything. Everything that breathes. Men, women, children, animals, everything. Okay? So first we're going to look at the scriptures that talk about that. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 7. We're going to do some page flipping here. So Deuteronomy chapter 7, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy chapter 7. And in verse 2, <clears throat> uh, if anybody wants to read, speak up. I'll, you know, I'll go ahead and read, but if you want to read, speak up. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 2, And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Okay? Now let's look at 
Joshua chapter 10 again, where we were before, but Joshua chapter 10, and right at the end of the chapter, verse 40, because Joshua complies with this command. Okay? Joshua chapter 10, verse 40. So Joshua, in chapter 10, verse 40, smote all the country of the hills and of the south and of the vale and of the springs and all their kings. He left none remaining, but utterly destroyed all that breathed as the Lord God of Israel commanded. <clears throat> so there's been a couple of ways that Christians, um, students who are concerned about apologia, about a defense, you know, a reasoned defense for what happens in Scripture. There's a couple of ways they've dealt with this. One is that God wasn't really saying kill everything, that he was exaggerating in his language like many times Scripture does. For example, um, Sunday when Pastor David was expounding on the passage about forgiveness, and Jesus said, forgive 70 times 7. He wasn't talking about specifically 490 times. He was talking about the fact that there isn't an end to it by the use of just what's called hyperbole, right? Just gross exaggeration. In other words, you don't stop forgiving. So one approach to understanding this passage is when Moses said, you kill everything, God said to Moses, and Moses said to Joshua, you kill everything, that he was grossly exaggerating what Joshua was supposed to do, right? We'll go on, just stay with me. Another uh, point of that reasoning, of this approach, is that there weren't men, women and children involved because archeological evidence indicates there weren't significant civilian populations at Jericho or Ai or the other cities mentioned that in Joshua, that there weren't significant civilian populations there anyway, that they were war camps, okay? So it's not like they were going to kill women and children because archaeology doesn't support that they were there in the first place. And that the main purpose of the conquest was not annihilation. It was expulsion. God wanted to give Israel a promised land. The people that were there were supposed to be expelled along with their idolatry. And Israel would take, take occupancy, right? But that didn't necessarily mean that everything had to be annihilated. Now, that's one way that Christians have tried to understand this whole idea that God says kill everything. Right? So one way is expulsion, not annihilation. The language was exaggerated like sometimes the biblical language is. So that's one way of understanding. Right? I'm not saying that that's right. I'm just showing you the options that have come up among what I will call reasonable Christians, Christians who want to understand and are looking deeper. <clears throat> There's another approach. The other, so one is expulsion. Okay? The other approach is judgment. So with this kind of approach to understanding, let's look at a couple of scriptures um, because you have to understand why God wanted to do this and what his goal was. Deuteronomy chapter 9. And in verse 5. Um, anybody want to read? Go ahead. It is not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you have possessed their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, that the Lord your God drives them out from before you, and that you may fulfill the word which the Lord swore to your which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Good. Um, just a reminder, time-wise, historically, um, while I'm mentioning that, you can go to Leviticus chapter 18. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus chapter 18. Um, it mentions Abraham in Deuteronomy 9.5, and we looked last week at uh, Genesis 12 where the original promise for the promised land was made, where God initially said when Abraham was going through Canaan, says, I'm going to give you this land, right? That was about 2000 B.C., so what we're reading about with the Exodus and the entry into the Promised Land is about 500 years later, or 550, like the 1450 range, right? So about 500 years later, okay? That becomes important, keep that in mind, becomes very important. 
to understand. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 24 and 25. Anybody want to read? Go ahead. Okay, now, about the whole concept of a land being polluted by its occupants and their actions. That's a separate topic. We won't talk about that. But think about that in the context of what happens in the United States. Just consider that. We're not going to really talk about that. But think about that. Okay. Let's go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Um, verses 9 through 12. Anybody want to read? Okay. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 12. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Now, your modern translations have different words for all those Middle English words that I read. You know, necromancer, one who communicates with the dead, which, well, what are the other, some of the other more modern translations, what do they say about, uh, like, what's it say for charmer or consulter with familiar spirits? How does it translate that? Soothsayer? Okay. Okay, now, I, I didn't do this for you. I have in the past. I didn't do this for you. But yeah, do, do a quick Google search on some of those terms. And you'll see how common they are in our society. In North Carolina. In Kernersville. And I'm not kidding you. Mm -hmm. There's a, they're all over the place. Right, exactly. They're, and we'll talk about that as well. Uh, we'll talk about how commonplace they are in the United States. In the context of God commanding that you wipe them out. So, let's look a little further. Now, again, we're going to read a couple of things from this fellow, Greg Kugel. Greg Kugel, it's from his website, Stand to Reason. Um, again, if you, you know, if you want further information, you can look up on the web. I, generally speaking, don't like to just read something with you, but he says it a lot better than I can, so we're going to go ahead and read this. It's not very long, and I think it's worth your while to do it. Okay, so this is what he writes relative to this whole topic of God kills everything. This is where, you know, again, our first approach was it wasn't annihilation, it was expulsion. They didn't really kill all the women and children because archaeology indicates they weren't there anyway. These were man camps, so they went in and they killed. The, the whole kill everything was just military hyperbole, just gross exaggeration. Go kill them all, that kind of thing, okay? That's one approach. The other approach is God intended this because it was punishment, right? And... Um, we can go back and read it in Deuteronomy 7. But God's intention with Israel was that it was going to be a nation of priests. That in Genesis 12, if you read the blessing of Abraham, it says, all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through you. That was going to happen to the nation of Israel if Israel had, in fact, walked on God's word. If they had actually done what they were supposed to do, that would have happened. That's based on the original promise to Abraham in Genesis 12. But and we'll look at this when we look at Joshua 24. They never did that. And we'll look at that's another topic, and we'll look at all that later. Okay, so we're going to just read, so stick with me here if you would. God was angry. Indeed, he was furious, and with good reason. Even by ancient standards, the Canaanites were a hideously nasty bunch. Their culture was grossly immoral, decadent to its roots. Its debauchery was dictated primarily by its fertility religion, that tied eroticism of all varieties to the successful agrarian cycles of planting and harvest. Now, what that means is, 
in order to have a successful planting or harvest, their religion held that you, uh, pardon my language, you um, had sexual cor intercourse with everybody and everything. And we'll look at that. And I mean that sincerely. Okay? That was the core of their religion. That and child sacrifice. Now, we'll look at that further. Okay? In addition to divination, witchcraft, and female and male temple sex, Canaanite idolatry encompassed a host of morally disgusting practices that mimicked the sexually perverse conduct of their Canaanite fertility gods. Adultery, homosexuality, transvestitism, pederasty, sex with all sorts of beasts, and incest. Now, before we read on, does that sound familiar? I'm not kidding. You can read the newspapers in the United States of America and all this stuff is happening. There is, believe it or not, you can do your own research on this if you want to, there is an association that is dedicated to legitimizing sex between men and boys. I am not kidding you. Sooner or later, it's going to be legitimizing sex between humans and animals. Because we get on that slippery slope. And we'll talk about that as well. Worst of all, Canaanites practiced child sacrifice. There was a reason God had commanded, do not give any of your children to be, to be sacrificed to Moloch. Leviticus 18.21. Moloch was a Canaanite underworld deity represented as an upright bullheaded idol with a human body in whose belly a fire was stoked and in whose outstretched arms a child was placed that would be burned to death. And it was not just infants. Children as old as four were sacrificed. Now, they can find this out from archaeological remains. They can tell the age of a, you know, of a skeleton by its size, etc. They can tell all that stuff. They can tell how it died. They can tell that there were a whole bunch of them in one spot. I'm sorry, were you going to say something? A bronze, this is another idol that they worshipped, a bronze image of Kronos was set up among them, stretching out its cupped hands above a bronze cauldron, which would burn the child. As the flame burning, the, so they, they put the kid in these large hands that were part of the idol statue, right? They put the kid in there. The fire was below him, right? <clears throat> As the flame burning the child surrounded the body, the limbs would shrivel up, and the mouth would appear to grin as if laughing until it was shrunk enough to slip into the cauldron because it just, it desiccates the flesh. You know, everything just dries and tightens and then it drops into the, the fire. Okay, so this is, now, please remember, okay, um, archaeological evidence indicates that the children thus burned to death sometimes numbered in the thousands. We're not talking about an occasional child sacrifice here. We're talking about this was routine. Okay? These are the Canaanites. So how long were they engaged in this idolatry? Okay, well, this is an instance where, again, I just encourage you to read the Bible and remember what you read. Do you remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Do you know what kind of cities they were? Do you know where they were? Okay, if you don't, it's okay. They were at the bottom of the Dead Sea. They were Canaanite cities. God destroyed them during the lifetime of Abraham in Genesis 18 and 19, 500 years before this, for their immorality. Canaanite cities, 500 years before God chose to judge them by destruction. Exactly. So how long has this been going on? Centuries? at least centuries. The other thing that I think can come up, this is not part of what Greg Kukul talked about, but the other thing that can come up for people is that they have the opportunity to believe, right? Okay, so in Joshua chapter 2, again, we read, we're reading Joshua and we're remembering what we read. So we read about Rahab, right? So where did Rahab live? Jericho, right? And 
Do you remember what Rahab said to the two spies about, well, let's just, let's just look at it. Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. There's a couple of verses. And we'll read in verses, verse 9. Maybe, maybe through 11, but we'll start in verse 9. This is Rahab speaking. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the, inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard, we, we have heard, how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. How long before she talks about it did it happen? Forty years. So did they have a chance to believe? Rahab did. And she was relating it to an incident that happened 40 years before. And she probably wasn't even alive then. Maybe, I I don't know, but possibly she wasn't even alive when it happened. Somebody told her. Somehow she heard about it. Somehow she got to believe to the point that she's in the Christ line. (laughs) Could they have believed? Guessing they could have. Rahab did. I'm guessing if she says we, she means she's not the only one who heard this. And I'm guessing if all of the um, Canaanite cities are trying to gang up on Israel, that everybody knows what Israel's about. Everybody knows what God did with Israel to get them there in the first place. Everybody knows that. And most everybody chose not to believe it. But Rahab believed it. Let's keep reading. <clears throat> and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of other side Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we had heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, here we go, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now if Rahab can, Rahab can make that decision based on what she heard, why couldn't other people have done that as well? Did they have a chance to believe? Looks to me like they did. Okay, so, and then, yeah, let's kind of wind down, and we'll be finishing up here in a couple minutes. The crux of the problem, um, when we look at something like Joshua chapter 10 or Deuteronomy 7, you know, when God says to Moses, you wipe everything out. And so that's God's command, and Joshua carries it out. Okay, so you, if somebody asks you, you know, that if he says that that's wrong, well, what are you talking about? The fact that God commanded or the fact that Joshua carried it out? Which one do you object to? Okay, in any case, so Moses commands, kill them all. Joshua carries that out. When we look at that, <clears throat> the crux of the problem, and we'll just read this, in a certain sense, the lesson of the conquest of them going into the promised land is a simple one. God punishes evil. For many in our culture, though, the Canaanite offenses simply are not offensive. Divination, sexual adventure, adultery, homosexuality, transvestitism, all evil? Please. Okay, so as I said, you can pick up a newspaper, probably most places in the United States, thankfully not the Kernersville paper. I love it. I subscribe to it. It's a great paper. But most papers in most major cities in the United States, you could read about all this stuff. So what happens when evil is commonplace? What happens? Our consciousness, it's talked about in 1 Timothy 4, we'll look at it. It says their conscience gets seared with a hot iron. It's the, it is the Greek word cauterize, from which we get, which we get the English word cauterize. You know, this is the way in surgery, if somebody goes in to have a total knee replacement, right? So they try to get all the blood out of the limb as much as they can so they have as little bleeding as possible. But during the surgery, there's some blood in there, and they're going to have a little bit of bleeding. So with the small vessels, they cauterize them. You can hear the flesh burn as they do it because that's the way they stop the bleeding. Right? Not the big ones, but the small ones. They cauterize them. It can also mean brand. Okay? So the point is, when evil is commonplace, <clears throat> let's read one other thing here. Yeah, most of our problems regarding God's ordering the destruction of the Canaanites 
Clay Jones and other fellow Hesites, uh, Clay Jones writes, come from the fact that God hates sin, but we do not. Okay, so the sins we read about that were commonplace in Canaan, unfortunately, they're commonplace in our country too. Right? You can read about them in any newspaper. And what happens then is even Christians begin to question whether the Bible, as our only rule of faith and practice, is absolute right and wrong. They begin to think, well, oh, it's relative. Transvestitism, you know, really, they're just dressing up in a girl's clothes. I mean, what difference does that make, really? So you begin to question. And you get on that slippery slope. It's not right or wrong anymore. You get on a slippery slope. <clears throat> so the life lesson on all this stuff, for me, is um, how do you feel about sin? How do I feel about sin? Do I think there's an absolute right and wrong? Is there an absolute right and wrong? Does the Bible, is the Bible that right and wrong? If so, does the Bible specify what's right and wrong for you, for your marriage, for your family? Is there an absolute right and wrong? Or when we read Joshua 10, and I read about God saying, kill them all, am I sort of tacitly, you know, quietly, I got the same question in my mind. Why do you do that? I mean, they weren't that bad. Right? But when you look closer, they were terrible and had been for a good solid four or five hundred years. So why would we question God for judging them or destroying them? Why would we do that? <clears throat> and has your, has, you know, my, I mean, I'm not asking you guys, this is questions to me too, has our conscience been seared? Is homosexuality okay? Is living together before marriage out of wedlock okay? Because we get on that slippery slope. We begin to question, is there an absolute right and wrong? If you get exposed to it enough, it becomes, it can become okay unless you are vigilant as a Christian. It becomes okay. And, I mean, this happens with lots of stuff. You get on a slide, and it's real hard to stop. So we talked about Colorado and conscience, and uh, I think that's it.